Praxis Prepper. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. This is another video with Andre Polgar and we are talking about economic collapse and just getting ourselves up to speed. He's been uh, kind enough to sit with me for four interviews uh, t talking about various topics about uh, in relation to a new book that he has released coming out, which I can't, for, I, for, it's a simple title. I don't know why I can't remember it. The Age of Anomaly. Uh, uh, that he has coming out, and he's uh, you know sitting with us, trying to get us a little bit more up to speed on a topic that a lot of us find a little bit daunting. Uh, in the first video, we talked about sort of how we got to the point that where people are kind of nervous generally about what's going on, and in this video, we're going to talk specifically about what kind of keeps Andre up at night uh, in terms of what he sees coming down the pipeline. Now, I know he's not. He's not the kind of person that's going to tell you, I know exactly what's going to happen and exactly when it's going to happen, you know, down to the minute or anything. I mean, I think anyone that does that, I think he describes in his book as being a charlatan. And I agree with that. I think you have to take a sense of humility and, uh, uh, you know, understand that, you know, we don't always know everything, but we can read trends and Andre is really good at that. And again, thank you, Andre, for sitting down with us today. What keeps you up at night? Right off the bat, I want to make it clear that I'm an economist who is not afraid of volatility. Like I, I even uh, study and actively trade cryptocurrencies. So it's not like I'm the type of person who is easily spooked by something like a massive collapse of the stock market or a 60% correction in real estate. No. What I want to get across is that, particularly speaking, I'm worried about one thing and one thing only. That precise moment when the narrative changes. In our previous video, I made it clear that so far the narrative has been, we have a crisis, governments and central banks are coming to the rescue. This happened with the dot-com bubble, this happened with the Great Recession, and as I've also explained in the previous video, central bankers and governments have all the incentives in the world for them to want to continue with this narrative. So what I'm, what I'm afraid of is not that we are going to have another crash, because of course we're going to have another crash, it's just the business cycle. Even more so, only once has it happened that more time passed between recessions than in the present. So, cyclically speaking, we are due, or even overdue, if you will, another crash. But I'm not worried about it. I'm worried about what happens next, because you see, of course, we are going to have our usual deflationary shock that manifests itself through a stock market crash, through a real estate crash or whatever. People are going to panic. It's all going to be gloomy. And of course, governments and central banks are going to come to the rescue and say, not to worry, we're going to do more of the same. We're going to lower interest rates even more. We're going to stimulate the economy even more and we're going to save the day. There's just one problem. Eventually, the market is going to say no. And what are they going to do next? Uh, as I've mentioned previously, the market will demand an ever-increasing dose of stimulus. And since last time they did something as dramatic as lowering interest rates to zero in the US and even negative territory in the European Union and Japan, let's not even talk about the trillions that have been pumped into the system. Maybe this time in the US, for example, they're going to say, hey, we're going to lower interest rates all the way down to negative 1% and we're also going to pump 3.5 trillion per year into the system rather than one. And as you can see, w things are already in an area of absurd and a case could be made that you don't have to be an economist, you don't have to be a quant, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that sooner rather than later, the market's gonna say no, we had enough. 0% is bad enough at minus at negative 1%, maybe I'm going to take my money out of the banking system. As I've explained on my channel on more than one occasion, since we run on a fractional reserve system, the banking system is in deep trouble if enough people take their money out. Like I cannot think of one bank in this on, on this planet among the big ones that would be able to withstand on its own something like 3 out of 10 people taking their money out. That's not going to happen. And what I mean by this and what keeps me up at night is the fact that I I don't predict, it's not, you, if you're on the 10th uh, story of a building and someone says he intends to jump and you say, no, it's a bad idea, you're gonna die, then you're not making a prediction, you're just stating the obvious and that's what I'm doing now. I am telling people that sooner rather than later, 
after an exogenous shock like a market crash and after uh, the authorities try to do more of the same and kick the can down the road for yet another cycle, the market's going to say no. I no longer have confidence in your ability to meaningfully do so. And this right there is the key word. What keeps me up at night is a loss of confidence on a massive scale. And words cannot begin to describe how thin of a thread it is, how thin the thread is that keeps it, it all together when it comes to society, and that thread is called confidence. When confidence is lost in the banking system, in the monetary system, and so on, then we are unfortunately in for an extremely brutal generation-defining transfer of wealth, or as I like to call it in my book, a big reset type situation and I don't, it, it gives me goosebumps just thinking about what's going to happen to the average person. Well, people in the preparedness community certainly can understand the idea of a loss of confidence <laughs> in authorities. I mean, that's why a lot of us are here. You know, we see things around the world where, you know, authorities, I, I on my channel, I don't really uh, subscribe to the idea of, you know, the nefarious, you know, overlords, uh, you know, from above that are, you know, trying to, you know, reduce our populations through, you know, nefarious means and everything. I, I see the system as being just a lot of, like you say, individuals who work on, you know, towards their own self-interest and sometimes that self-interest doesn't include you or me. Uh, and just being realistic about that. Um, and I think that, um, it's really easy to, you know, to kind of wrap your head around uh, that idea that, uh, you know, this could all just come apart when more people start realizing that kind of thing. Now, uh, one thing that people in the preparedness community will occasionally get, uh, you know, accused of is the idea that we, through spreading the idea that maybe some systems can't be relied upon, are through that action promoting the the loss of confidence that would create a situation where the system w would fall apart how would you deal with a criticism like that where where you're saying your very fear is the idea that people are going to get wise to the way things are and while at the same time you're at you, what your effort is is to try to get people wise <laughs> to the way things are like how, how would you deal with that criticism i'm not personally leveling that at you i think it's great to spread information and i, I think living in a, an artificial cloud is not you know a good place to be but how would you respond to that kind of criticism of someone saying you know you are gonna you know promote this exact kind of fear that you're worried about be being promoted well first of all i apologize for using the metric system but i'm going to say that we're driving in a car at 100 kilometers per hour and there's a huge brick wall in front of us. I'm the guy who tells us, knowing that the braking distance, I don't know, give or take is going to be, let's say, 100 meters, 10 to the power of 2, I'm the guy who says, hey, let's hit the brake pedal. And there's just one problem with society as a whole as I see it, you know. If you hit the brake pedal 200 meters away from the wall, then maybe you're being excessively prudent, you know, like a lot of people say about the preparedness community. Oh why are you preparing so much when everything's so rosy but you by doing so you know you're gonna be just fine but fine okay you wait a bit you hit the brake pedal when you're 150 meters away no problem problem at all you wait until you're 100 meters away this is what i don't like because if you wait until then what if the weather conditions are not perfect what if the state of the road is not perfect and your braking distance is longer than you had anticipated in that case you do risk things like minor car damage the same way, if you wait until you're, I don't know, 60 meters away, you risk potentially serious injuries as well. Whereas if you wait until you're 10 meters away from the wall, then I'm sorry, but you can have the best driver in the world behind the steering wheel. It's not going to end well. So what we are doing here right now, what I'm doing in our case, what, what you do through your channel, we are the people who say, let's hit the brake pedal. And hitting the brake pedal means facing reality. It's not always pleasant. It's not always nice, but there's just one problem. The longer we wait, the more painful it's gonna be. So what we're doing, in my view at least, is a tremendous public service by telling people, let's just take the damage now. Let's just take the hit now. Perhaps it's a bit too late to get out of it without even a minor scratch on our car. I firmly believe it is in our analogy, but let's do it. Let's do it now because if we wait longer and it seems that people around us are more than willing to wait it out, it's going to get downright bloody, 
unfortunately. Well, I'll, I will remember that explanation next time I get con confronted with the, 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 you know, the same criticism. Um, so. In our next video we, uh, that we're going to be talking about on this topic, you know, Andre is going to share with us sort of how he gauges our distance to that wall. In his a analog, he talks about the idea that you know at the moment maybe we're a hundred meters away. I, I'm in America, so I don't know what the f a, a meter is, um, but uh, yeah. I, I don't know. But you know, whatever system of measurement you're using, how to gauge, you know, how close we are to that. You know, what are the warning signs that we can look for so we're not that person that is like slamming on the brakes, you know, because we're afraid of, you know, hitting a wall and we stop two miles in advance and everyone's like, you know, what was all that? <laughs> so kind of getting a sense so you don't throw yourself out of the system way earlier than you need to, but at the same time, you're not smashing into that wall. So thank you for your time with us today, Andre, and uh, next time we'll be talking about that. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.